Welcome back to Humans of Ethereum. In this episode, I have a very fun conversation on all things governance and crypto law with Anya Bly. Anya is a very gifted lawyer who is heavily involved in a bunch of important initiatives such as the Degov Foundation and Koala, which build bridges between the brilliant scholarship and thinkers and practitioners in the non-blockchain world uh, in fields including not just governance, but um, things like conflict resolution and ethics and, and philosophy with um, all the brilliant folks in our own blockchain community. In this episode, we talk about space law, we talk about crypto law, we talk about DAOs and autonomous systems in general, and just have a very fun, engaging conversation about what this all means for us and for humanity at large. Without further ado, let's kick off with the final episode of season one, episode 12 of Humans of Ethereum featuring Anya Bly. I'm so excited to catch up and hear your human story today. How's it going? It's going very well. Um, yeah, the weather is still shitty here. <laughs> Where are you right now? I'm right now based in Slovenia. I'm home. Um, so it's nearby Ljubljana. It's a small village nobody knows about. Um, but yeah, it's uh, nice to be home. What is, the, what is the crypto or blockchain scene like there? Oh, crazy. Um, I mean, we were known to be a country that had a lot of ICOs and the hype was real. So a lot of people were just sitting, having a coffee and talking about blockchain and Bitcoin. So wow. to me, that was quite insane, at least in the capital city. Um, but yeah, I think it goes hand in hand with having a person that actually developed the cryptocurrency exchange, one of the first ones. So I think that influenced quite a lot. And even now people are talking about him. He moved to Malta and people are just like, oh, what's the weather in Malta? Um, and they're having <laughs> tons of interviews with him and everybody's excited about it still. Uh, but I think that the ICO hype did a bit of a damage there. So a lot of people are just, you know, uh, reluctant to talk about blockchain and the underlying technology just because they were scammed or just because they heard about Bitcoin and it are being used for scams. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's not just Slovenia. I think that may be a global phenomenon, the fact that it did some damage to the brand and maybe we're still digging out from that a little bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, correct. So, okay, cool. So before we go too deep down that rabbit hole, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Like in whatever way you want, your own human story, um, tell us who you are, tell us what you're up to, um, but with particular emphasis upon what you were doing like prior to the rabbit hole journey <laughs> and like how you kind of got into like blockchain, crypto, like all this stuff. Mm. All right, so um, bottom down, I'm a lawyer. Um, not that I was interested in law from when I was born or anything, but I'm a lawyer. Um, and how I very much became active in blockchain space was because I was writing the global law master thesis. And whenever you speak of the global law, it's an upgrade of the international law, I might say. Um, and there is a lot of parallels with the blockchain. So I was writing it in 2017 and I have friends from before that were interested in blockchain and all of a sudden they came to me and said, hey, we want to have a cryptocurrency ourselves. We want to make an ICO and we want to make crypto island. So we want to make an ICO and buy an island. And they needed a lawyer to buy an island. <laughs> so we were kind of creating the white paper, um, going through all the legal complications that one has when buying an island in Bahamas or wherever. Um, but I think that that was pretty much the time when I got really, really interested in the Ethereum blockchain and how the governance especially looked like, because at that time I was studying how the international law governance looks like. And when you study these two in, uh, at the same time, you find out quite a lot of similarities. And I thought that that's amazing. So all of a sudden I had global law, which is another dimension of law. And I was also previously studying the space law, which is yet another domain of the law. And then all of a sudden you have the virtual domain, which blows your mind away. So I think that was pretty much what brought me into the rabbit hole. Um, although altogether, I mean, it started soonish rather. Uh, so that was in 2017 and- And what, so, Take us back a tiny bit further. Like what, 
attracted you to law in the first place? I'm just trying to, again, understand kind of the human journey here. Like what, what sort of prerequisites were there or was there something earlier in your life that, um, I don't know, maybe your mind works a certain way or something? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I'm not sure if I ever figure that out. <laughs> no, for real. I mean, um, hmm. so I finished the high school and for pretty much a large amount of my time um, of my life, I thought that I'm going to become an architect. So I was pretty sure that I'm going to be an architect, um, but I never took the exam that was necessary. And then all of a sudden I was visiting different colleges. And it made sense for me to kind of enroll into the law faculty. Although I must admit that everyone that enrolls, if they are not coming from a lawyer family, they have a very much different idea of how the law profession actually looks like. So you think that it's like suits or, you know, Boston legal or something? <laughs> far from that. Very, very far from that. You so end do, you, up... do you come from a legal family? Like, did you have a sense of this or not really? <laughs> I actually come from a family where my dad does not really like lawyers, so we have fierce debates. Um, and usually they would be around who makes the laws and who argues the laws. So the makers are actually the regulators, the legislators. So it's not really the lawyers, it's more or less the politics. Um, and it took me quite a while to explain how this happens and how these uh, functions. And yes, I'm not coming from a legal family at all. I think that's influencing it quite a lot. Amazing. Okay. So you were telling us about governance and about how you were writing a master's uh, thesis, I think you said, right, on global law. Yep. And how did you first hear about or get involved in Ethereum? Hmm. I think it was pretty much because of the ICOs and the ERC tokens. Um, right. I, heard of, yeah, I heard of Ethereum before, so the first time I heard of blockchain was three years before that happened, probably, or two. People were mostly just asking me what's up with the taxes because they knew I'm a lawyer and at that time nobody had any opinions, there was no laws. Um, so it was just how we explained it. But when I got into the um, ICOs and when people were asking me what's, what's up with the ERC tokens, can we actually create that kind of a token? Um, I digged in and Ethereum just popped up. You know why, right? So totally. the ERC tokens are pretty much based on it and it was time for me to really have a deep dive into it. Sweet. Um, so what happened next? Did you finish your law degree? Did you practice law or did you just get sucked into the rabbit hole like the rest of us or both? <laughs> yeah. So what happened next is that I put on a hold my master thesis, but that was because I was very much into the space law and I really wanted to continue with the moot court. Um, so we don't really have a subject for space law, but the only way you can actually learn it here is to join a moot court. And it, it lasts for a, a year or two if you decide to coach another team. Um, so yeah, it took me, what, two years just to join the moot court competition and to have a deep dive into space law before I actually have um, started with the blockchain. Wow, that is so exciting. Um, I... I know literally nothing about space law. This is so interesting. I know um, Yalda, maybe you know her in our community, was talking about launching a, a space project on Ethereum. Uh, I don't know if that's relevant or not, but like, can you say a tiny bit more? Like, what is space law and where is it right now? And, you know, what, maybe, maybe compare it to like Ethereum governance or maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the governance of space law is still uh, very much looking like the international laws. They make the governance in the UN. Um, the treaties are pretty old. That was a surprising factor there. So the treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, for example, which is one of the biggest ones, um, the most ratified ones, it was written and ratified in 1965 already. And it was written in the time where people were kind of afraid that another space race is going to happen. Um, and it could cause worse. So what people were re really looking into was just the prohibition of all the nuclear weapons in space. Um, and that's established. And altogether, to me, it's fun. I mean, as another surprising factor, for example, is that everyone proclaimed the space to be of all mankind. So it's not that nobody owns it. 
<laughs> it's not that you can go online and buy a certificate to buy a slot on the moon. That's kind of not legal. I mean, it's not that it's illegal or anything, but it's pretty much like you would buy an Eiffel Tower. So <laughs> I'm not sure if I, yeah, people still buy it. So it's fun. Um, yeah, there's, yeah definitely, there's definitely been hucksters or entrepreneurs or whatever you want to call them who have um, taken advantage of like the Homesteading Act in the United States and tried selling plots of land on the moon. I remember hearing about this more than 10 years ago. And it still happens. I mean, there's even a Schumacher, it's a person and he kind of bought or claimed to own the asteroid. And then NASA landed on, the, on that same asteroid and he just issued a parking ticket to NASA. Of course, NASA took it to American court and the, the court said, no, 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 wait, you cannot really own the asteroid. You cannot issue us a parking ticket. That's not legal. It's against the international law. But what the, what the America did, um, together with Luxembourg, they actually introduced a law which allows you to own the minerals. And that's something new, right? So that's something that other countries are not really um, into it, or um, there's a huge debate in the UN, whether that's allowed or not, because there's another treaty called Moon Treaty, not a lot of countries ratified it or signed it, but still the treaty actually explains that there is going to be a moratorium, which means that it's prohibited to mine to extract the minerals unless we have a common agreement or like a system on how we're going to distribute all these minerals. And when we are talking about that, that's pretty similar to Ethereum. So we can think of everything that we have, the digital assets, and then we think of how we're going to distribute them and how are we going to talk about them? Because just like you said, it's not only the countries, it's also the entrepreneurs. And all of a sudden in 21st century, there's a lot of companies that are entering the space. So it's not only that you have the space nations that are space faring nations, you also have a lot of space faring companies. And all of a sudden, I think that they are creating a dialogue as well. It's not only that they're lobbying the UN and the nation states, um, but they are actually influencing the policy. And we might even be thinking if somebody lands and creates a moon base or a Mars base or whatever happens, if it becomes autonomous, because that's pretty much what we aim for, um, we are going to have another governance body. So we're going to be talking to someone that is out of our reach that we cannot really put in the UN. And I think that the same is happening in blockchain. You cannot really regulate it so much. So all of a sudden you have a self-regulating body and you just hope that the self-regulation is going to suffice. So those are the similarities, I think. That is so mind-blowing. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, yeah, I was going to start by saying, okay, there's some clear differences. Like you said, space law is very old, and it sounds like a, you know, a lot of this body of, of international law was established 60 or 70 years ago, which mm -hmm. makes sense. Um, but yeah, there's clearly some overlap here. And you know, as, a, as a computer scientist, as a non-legal uh, scholar, what I have always found so fascinating about law is... Like we tend to, <clears throat> and we'll go more into this kind of wet code, dry code question, right? But like mm -hmm. software engineers, we tend to like look at law and like try to break it. Sorry, look at code and try to break it, right? <laughs> this is what we do. We think about writing like unit tests or like looking for edge cases and stuff. And it's not hard to find edge cases in even, what should I call it? Terrestrial law, right? So let's say like law mm -hmm. on earth over our nation states. And there's all sorts of like, um, you know, like plots of land that aren't clearly part of one country or another or multi-jurisdictional or this or that. Obviously, international law is already very complicated, right? Anytime you even have two, you know, companies headquartered in two different countries, you know, transacting together, you have these questions of international law. But when you introduce space law or blockchain law, like you said, like it just, it just breaks my entire mental model. And I have to like go back to, to, to square one to try to like understand like some of the most basic, basic questions about law. Like what does jurisdiction mean and who is in charge? Um, yeah, like you said, we're going to have entities that can't be part of the UN unless we decide that the UN is interstellar or, you know, <laughs> that's such a fun thing to think about. Um, uh, hmm. I mean, when you think of it like that, you said that um, the difference between space law and blockchain is that space law is pretty old. Um, sure, we can say it's a dinosaur, but the concept of law is even older. So even the, the sole concept of the UN it's older, uh, but it's not that old. So when we think of the international law, that's, you know, a couple of centuries ago, but that's not that old. Um, the concept of law existed 2000 years ago and even further on. So people created the laws, people created the rules because they kind of saw a pattern. 
And if it's a very clear pattern with only one single outcome, I think it's very, very similar to the code. And we could really be talking about how code could mm, become something that replaces the law to some extent. But <laughs> when you said that, you know, you coders want to break the rules and you want to break the code. Well, what we do is we want to find the ambiguities. So we want to find the holes in the laws or um, things that we can perhaps explain differently. And it's basically because at that very point when the law was created, we observed one pattern and we created a rule that fitted that very specific time and place. And then 10 years afterwards or 50 years afterwards, even hundreds of years afterwards, we don't really might want to change or accept a whole new law, but just go with a simple explanation that fits us today. So it's easy, it's an easy way out, um, but it also means that the law all of a sudden becomes a very fluid uh, topic, <laughs> if we might say that. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. That's something that I've just begun to understand from folks <laughs> such as yourself and, you know, um, uh, groups such as Koala. Speaking of, um, let's, before we go too deep down the like crypto law rabbit hole, which I think you and I are both keen to explore a little bit here, um, just catch us up to the present. So I know you're very involved in initiatives like DGov and Koala and I'm sure other exciting stuff. Um, tell us what you're working on now and, and how it's going. Um, well, in DGov, we are actually working right now on the internal governance. Can you um, introduce well, DGov just to explain? People here may have no idea what it is. Okay, okay. Um, so DGov stands for Distributed Governance, uh, Distributed Governance Foundation. We don't really have a legal entity, but the point why we are uh, together, that's not funny. <laughs> so why I, learned we... that, I, know, I, I learned that recently and I think it's, it's great. I also learned that supposedly, you know, Libra has this like Libra association, which also doesn't mm. exist legally. <laughs> and I, I jokingly used, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this idea of like counterfactual state channels, right? Which is this technology, this layer two scaling technology in Ethereum. And it's like two parties can like transact as if, there were like a contract deployed on mainnet that they could like, like resolve disputes using. Mm -hmm. And they can do that even though it doesn't actually exist because either party has the, they've, they've agreed on what that would contain and they can appeal, they can deploy it if necessary. So this is the idea of counterfactual instantiation. You gotta right? write that just, down for me or you have to point me, you gotta yes. write that down for me or point me towards uh, like read on articles. Because what I think is very interesting is that I just recently discovered that there are unincorporated cooperatives. To me, it makes zero sense that the law offers you the unincorporated legal entity with some legal efforts. So to me, that's a contradiction that law would supposedly offer us, uh, but it exists in many jurisdictions. So it's pretty much a similar concept. You have an unincorporated cooperative and later on, it can actually have the legal effects if you reach that benchmark. Uh, yeah, so back to DGov. <laughs> uh, it stands for Distributed Governance Foundation. Um, it was created, I think, two years ago, the whole idea of it, uh, because there were different groups of blockchain people uh, from different projects, and they all kind of have a similar um, idea or similar issue, even better said. Um, so what the issue was that all of them were thinking about how the governance actually happens, um, how it influences the code, how the forks are happening, how people are um, talking to each other. And I think that that was the very moment when a lot of developers got to understand that it's not only about the code, it's not only about the mathematics, but it's also about the sociology behind it. It's also about the psychology uh, about it, behind it, the philosophy and the social interactions that we are having and perhaps even the politi political science. And of course the law, right? Um, because that would be something that you usually put down in the articles of um, association or the statute when the entity is being established, etc. So all of a sudden, um, Tim Van Sumer introduced the idea to a couple of people and he said, okay, what we need to do right now is to bring these people all together, not just from blockchain space so they can learn from each other and share the experience, but we need to bring more people from the outside. We need to communicate that to social politicians, to the economists, to the sociologists, and invite them into the blockchain space. And we've done that. Uh, we've done that in January on the first council that we had in Berlin. 
Um, and what was the most interesting thing to observe is that we need to create a dialogue between these people, these um, interdisciplinary and very, very various people, because we have different understandings of how blockchain works. So we need to educate first. Uh, and the second thing was that we have very, very different understanding of what a DAO presents. So when it comes to a DAO, uh, decentralized autonomous organization, I mean, there is so many different types of organizations, legally speaking, but when we are thinking about decentralized, decentralized organization and organization alone, we can think of it like a sum up of all the SAR contracts that we have. And this is how developers might think of it. But when you speak to a random person on the street, it's more or less about, okay, yeah, us coming together and then doing something very, very, um, like all the time, the same thing, um, very, very repetitive, if that's an English expression. <laughs> and, then, okay, uh, and then this creates a stack almost of that pattern. And this is how they think of a DAO. So it's not at all connected to the code. To me, that was a very um, revealing fact. And this is what Digov is all about, to explore what there is, to discover how people think and what, how they understand um, the collaboration that we can create together with technology. But not only with technology, more or less um, with the values integrated in deep in us and then create like a cohesive framework or even tools and a platform where we can collaborate better together so that we also, in Dralia, address all the social issues or all the global issues that we have. I mean, deep down, there is an issue or a problem um, that is quite striking. And that's pretty much the global changes that we are currently seeing. And I think that a lot of people in blockchain uh, ecosystem are pretty much aware. And this is sometimes even the reason why people are developing the decentralized solutions that current systems are simply not enough. They are not helping us. They are actually backwards. So all of a sudden we have this global community and rigid old system that we call the UN and all these organizations and all these corporations that are entering the space, but nobody really knows how to address these issues. Nobody really knows how to use the science so that it leverages the whole humanity. And it's quite hurting the people. <laughs> it's scary when you think of it. So yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that's something that many of us in our community have in common is just this general perception that the existing system isn't working very well and mm -hmm. you know it's not a level playing field um, and it you know disproportionately benefits insiders who were in the right place at the right time and in many cases this is kind of like previous generations I'm thinking now about things like real estate etc so I guess the question I have is like what role do you oh that's really pretty Oh, oh, yeah. I got a little view of the, the village outside your window. <laughs> yeah, it's really nice. What? Oh, it's what really role... nice. Sorry, Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it's really nice, but foggy. No, it's okay. What role do you think um, blockchain in general and Ethereum and cryptocurrencies and I don't know, maybe space law and global law and all this stuff, what role do you think they have to play in like building a better future and, and resolving some of these issues that we face? Mm, so I, sometimes I like to explain it to the people that don't really know about blockchain um, in terms of the HTTPS. So when you open a browser and you see or you type in a Google address or whichever address, you see the HTTPS um, in the corner. And today people don't even know what it stands for. But it's basically a protocol that we need for all these websites to function. Um, and this is how I see the blockchain in the future. It's going to be an underlying protocol that a lot of people are not even going to be aware of because there, there's not going to be a need for it, but there's going to be a huge need to have it um, so that we have secured or better communication with people. Um, and I do believe that it holds the potential to actually distribute um, and to communicate and to create a better word in terms of, uh, I mean, in a lot of segments. If I focus on space law alone, um, there's currently an issue on how we're going to distribute the extracted minerals, the resources in space, when it becomes feasible and when we're actually going to do so. But let's say the time frame is 10 or 20 years maybe 50. 
it's still a question. How are we going to do that? Are we going to go the old ways? Are we going to simply create international treaties and then hope that all the countries and all the actors are going to respect the international treaties? I mean, come on, who are we fooling? We already know that that's not happening, that that's not really working. It works, but it's not working well. <laughs> and it could be working much, much better if we would have the means. I do believe that smart contracts and the blockchain actually presents one of those means. It's one of the technologies that we can actually use so that we create better international agreements, so that we actually create trust among those people that don't really have the trust. I think that's pretty much it for me. Cool. No, that's that's a as strong an argument as I've ever heard about why smart contracts and blockchain and platforms like Ethereum make sense. Um, yeah, I mean, I, we obviously agree about the potential, and I think it is enormous potential and a very powerful set of ideas. But um, I guess what I want to ask is about the reality today, because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of things happened two years ago, right? You mentioned DGov was was created two years ago, and you know, two years ago happens to be when I, you know, began deep diving and you know, joined the Ethereum community, um, and there was this incredible groundswell of like optimism and excitement at that moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here we are two years later and then we're in crypto winter and, and more to the point, like, I think price is less important, but I think what's more important is like the state of technology and the state of the community. And what I feel more and more is that we just have a long, long, long way to go. You know, that you can't, I mean, technology moves quickly, but maybe not fast enough, you know, for some of the things we're talking about. And so part of me, you know, feels hopeful that like in our lifetime, we'll start to see some of these like new, better institutions built on, you know, transparent, participatory institutions, et cetera, like come to life. But then now I feel like, well, actually, we still haven't managed to scale these tools. And most, you know, we have a branding problem and, and you know, Ethereum is still very hard to use. So we have usability issues, et cetera. What are your thoughts on like the reality of like where we are today and what we need to like actually start building some of these things and, and getting people to use them? It's so funny. Um, you said that uh, the technology is not moving fast enough. And in my opinion, it's the opposite. The technology moves so fast that no one else but technologists are capable of just following up. Um, I mean, okay, don't get me wrong, I'm a lawyer, right? So the law is always going to lag behind the innovation. Um, that's one. Uh, it's hard to actually speak about DAOs, about smart contract. I mean, <laughs> just two, two days ago, we had a conversation with one of our ministries and we were explaining what a smart contract is. And it's so interesting. I mean, you can find the definitions online. You can simply ask people from this community and it's not going to be enough. So whenever there's a fast development in the technological space, you really need to take care of how this is going to be communicated to the people that are not into technology so much. Um, otherwise, you're just creating another clique. You're going to create um, a specific type of person or a community that is, be, that is going to be the only one really deeply understanding the technology. And I mean, okay, that's going to happen either way, right? That's inevitable. That happens in every scientific field. So we're already aware of that happening here. But it has so many applications. It has so um, broad impact that we do need a better understanding of what's actually happening behind the scenes. Um, I do believe that the price is actually influencing the whole community much, um, uh, much more than we anticipated, apparently. Um, I thought that that was pretty obvious and a lot of people that were early investors actually thought of it as well. So the first question was, how can money just exist? How can it just be mined? Um, and that was pretty much the first question that people were bumping in. And then the other one was, how are these people being paid? And, you know, a lot of people, <laughs> when that was the hype of the ICOs, were promised the tokens for their work. And <laughs> there were some people that never, ever accepted the tokens because, I mean, if you didn't really believe in the project or you haven't been really sure about whether it's going to be pulled off or not, whether it's going to hit the exchange and you're going to be able to liquidate the assets, then why have those tokens? Um, and being paid in something that you cannot really exchange and then use for, I don't know, the rent or something, that's not, it's not providing you for survival. So if we don't really cover the survival needs, if we don't really cover the paychecks, if we don't really take care of the community, 
but just creating stuff saying, hey, this is going to make you a millionaire. This is going to save your life. This is going to save the world. It's going to change so much uh, systematic problems that we're having. We're over promising. And that was one of the biggest problems. Um, and when, where we are right now, I think it was um, the crypto winter that was pretty much needed so that people woke up in a way. Um, it was first, it was a shock. And then the second one was, as far as I see here, a uh, revelation of what people are capable of achieving and what was perhaps over promised. So right now people are pulling back and saying, yeah, there, there are some stuff that blockchain is never going to solve. Um, and what I would very much argue for is that there is no technology whatsoever that can change people's mindsets. It can help, but it's not going to be technology alone that is going to do that. So yeah, when we are thinking about where are we going, um, there is going to be tons of applications that are going to be built on Ethereum. And yes, we're going to uh, hit a point where it's not even going to be relevant whether you understand the blockchain and how it fundamentally works. And that's fine. We're going to have experts. The only thing that we really need to take care of is who are those experts? Who do we trust? Um, create some sort of, uh, I don't know, elements that we are checking or um, yeah, some sort of an evaluation um, process so that we have that established so that we actually know how the community functions, who is out there. Hard, hard to know in a truly decentralized community. I feel like we've done this, <laughs> this community mapping exercise many times, including when you and I met at Koala, that was like the third or fourth time I tried to do it. And you know, you fill the whiteboard and then you start adding more columns and you, you have all these yeah. edge cases and things. Um, okay, I have a related question. What does Ethereum mean or represent to you? Hmm. Um, it grown to my heart. It's um, one of the communities from blockchain space that is really, really open to the newbies. Um, and there is a lot of understanding. Um, I think socially speaking, it's one of the best communities I've ever encountered. I, it really feels like you found your tribe especially with koalas. It's a lot of lawyers, a lot of um, think alikers if we can say that. Um, and we are all very much focusing on the problems and on the um, interesting questions. So I think it's a, a lot of people in this community are um, explorers, researchers. We are almost like on the verge of some discovery and we are just all going to the same direction. So in a way, it really feels like a family. <laughs> you have to travel a lot. You, you're constantly in different places. So you have to bind with these people in the community and you have to find yourself very comfortable. Um, but at the same time, I think we all strive for not being comfortable and constantly being outside our comfort zone. I remember coming to the first koala I have ever visited and I was constantly on Google, just typing in words that I have never heard before. <laughs> So it wasn't really the ERC token, but I remember that it was the EIP process. <laughs> and to me, that was something completely new. So this is pretty much how it feels like on every blockchain conference. And then you have to come home and explain to the community that pretty much never heard of the Ethereum community and never heard of the EIP. And you have to start at the very beginning. And it's like for back and forth, back and forth. Um, and I think that the Ethereum community is a community of experts. Um, it's huge, it's very broad. Um, and I, I think we haven't really included a lot of miners, which is surprising because I just uh, actually bumped into that information. Um, but yeah, I think it's one of the first blockchains that really deeply involved talks about governance. And this is what I like a lot about Ethereum, about governance and about law. And there's even a notion of having a crypto law. There's even a notion of having a Ethereum jurisdiction or um, a dispute resolution mechanism. And this is something that I find quite interesting. So this is, there's so many awesome things to unpack here. I wish we had five hours to do this. Um, so you talked a lot about the community and you know I share your sentiments, of course. It's huge, it's full of experts and fascinating people. Um, what is Ethereum as a platform to you? Is it is, is it like, is it, how do I say this? Is it a Supreme Court for the planet or the universe? Is it like a final court of appeal? Is it literally just a platform for building software? Is it something else entirely? 
it's not a jurisdiction and it's definitely not a Supreme Court. Um, if it's going to be anything similar to a dispute resolution, um, it's actually going to be similar to an alternative dispute resolution mechanism, uh, which I think is a breakthrough either way. But altogether, I actually think it's um, two folded. So one is pretty much the software, the underlying software, it's a blockchain. So it's the layer zero or layer one, if you want to say. And then there's going to be a lot of different applications, but if we're going to take care of the bridges, then we're really going to have a huge um, network of all these different blockchains being connected. That's one. And the other one is pretty much the community. So I think that Ethereum people actually have a huge sense of belonging. Uh, we are all fans of, block of Ethereum and we know why. <laughs> um, partially, it's actually for the community alone. So if we take care of each other, uh, this is going to feel much more important to us and this is going to feel much better to work on. And this is what happened at the very beginning in Ethereum. It was one of the you know, pictures that was um, in a, uh, comparing the Bitcoin network and the Ethereum network and the Bitcoin network was full of hostesses and full of people just going on the conference being nicely dressed. And then you took the picture from Ethereum conference and it was all the developers sitting on the floor at 2 a.m. <laughs> still coding, still researching. Um, and this is how it feels like. I think that's far more exciting, but it depends on what your values are. And I think that a lot of people in Ethereum community have very aligned values. Cool. I agree with that. Um, all right, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's jump a tiny bit further down this rabbit hole. Uh, actually, so sorry, hold on. first, we mentioned Koala a couple times uh, before we dive into crypto law. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone is um, like, we don't use any terminology or refer to things that are Do you mind just explaining a tiny bit of what Koala is? Oh, sure. Uh, it stands for Coalition of Automated Legal Applications. Um, so far, it's run by Primavera de Filippi and Constance. Uh, I think you all know them. Um, so I think it's a collection of the best possible researchers um, in the legal field, the academics, and then they bring along a lot of economists, a lot of developers, um, a lot of different people, even the political science. Um, so all together, there's different topics that we are addressing, but more or less they come from the legal field. So there would be um, a topic about the privacy and the identification. There would be a topic about uh, how we compare the international law and blockchains. And there would be a topic that is specifically focusing on the governance systems. So they have different working groups and they have um, different workshops. So all together, they would have, I don't know, let's say three to five workshops per year maybe even more um, and people come together because we want to hear more to me the koala workshops are full of knowledge and i come there to learn so it's a very it's like a knowledge pond you go there and you get so much new information that your brain is blown away for days afterwards you would even have to get, go on vacation just to settle it in <laughs> or yeah um so koala is uh I think it's a group of researchers and we are trying to come up with solutions for the industry as well. So for, for example, the last quality that I went into was um, a very, like, that was really a breakthrough at one point. We were talking about DAOs and how uh, different DAOs can become autonomous from a previous DAO or how this development of a DAO can actually function and how it can be legally compliant. So all of a sudden, to me, it was clear even before, I mean, there is no way that we are going to wait for the legal framework to be gathered or to be created so that we have legally compliant DAOs. That takes a long time. It's something that we already know, the regulators are pretty slow, but altogether, at that moment, we compared it to Lex Mercatoria, which is pretty much a self-developed legal framework for all the traders. And it was developed, I think, in 18th century or something like that. And if you take a look at that and compare it to a DAO, you actually find out that we have right now a community that can be self-regulated and we can start on that. So that's why I say that the Koala Workshop was a breakthrough because we came together and we just put some of the principles on the paper and we said, okay, we can also create DAOs. We can also respect these principles within our community 
And then whenever there's going to be a point in time where the regulators are going to say, hey, we do want to create a rule, we do want to have a law, or we do want to issue the opinions, these rules, these principles are what they're going to take into account and they're going to check whether we are actually um, respecting that tradition almost or whether we are um, being bind by our own rules, whether we are expecting those rules. Cool. Um, yeah, that's super, super interesting and super helpful. I second everything you said about Koala. Um, yeah, obviously you and I met at a Koala event mm -hmm. focused on Ethereum governance a few months ago, and I just learned so much from you and the other legal scholars and, and just addressing these um, very fundamental but fascinating questions about like, can, can you know, are DAOs truly autonomous? Uh, you know, can they be made like like um, legible to regulators? Can they be made compliant, et cetera? Does it even matter because they already do exist? Um, okay, <laughs> so yeah, so let's do it. So let's let's jump in a little bit further. So like crypto law, right? I want to get your take on this. Is this a thing? Does it exist? If so, like what is it? What does it mean? That's an interesting one. Um, so yeah, I mean, it definitely exists because we coined it. <laughs> So it's out there and it's going to be debated and it's going to be taken into account. Um, people are going to be um, not really teaching it, but exploring the whole notion of it. So at first, to me, it seemed like, you know, you can call a law, whatever you see is a pattern, uh, whatever we can observe as a rule in the outside world. Um, and we also have Newton laws. So we have physical laws, we have legal laws, if you want to say. We have different types of laws that we are abiding or that we are having and respecting and using in our daily lives. When it comes to crypto law, there is many different uh, definitions of it. So right now, I think we are in time and space where we are still exploring what it actually means to have a crypto law. To me, it's pretty uh, interesting and I think it's going to happen sooner or later that we're going to create a virtual legal domain if we haven't yet. Um, I think that we already started with that creation process. Um, and the legal law is going to play quite a role there because it's going to be one of our very self regulatory rules that we are creating. Um, if we want to take it even further, the question is whether this crypto law can replace the laws that we already have. Um, so in a way, can a code replace the laws? And as said previously, it can to some extent. So if we have very, very clear outcomes, then we can codify that, sure. But <laughs> this is why the law is um, important. And what makes it interesting is that it can have different explanations. Um, this is what, it, what interests me when it comes to law. But I can easily see that when we are talking to a coder, when we are talking to someone that wants to create a very stable, a very secure environment for blockchain, for example, we don't want to have those ambiguities. We don't want to have many numerous outcomes that we don't even know how to explain. We want to have the certainty and the certainty is actually built on top of having one rule, one outcome. However, the certainty is also being built with introducing the ambiguities. So you want to have the baseline that every single case or every single rule is going to be explained in um, a certain manner. How we explain that certain rule or what it means should be open to our interpretation. And this is where we come to the wet code, the wet laws probably. Um, this is where we enter the natural laws instead of the positive laws uh, doctrine. And this is to me what it presents when we talk about the crypto law. It's going to open quite a lot of discussions about the natural legal doctrines and what value system we have and how we actually explain those rules. And I think that there's also a lot of um, explanation or explanatory rules in the international law already. If we take a look at those, and then combine them with whatever we know in crypto world, I think that that can create a new framework. <laughs> and this is going to be a very, very interesting field to explore. I agree, but like I'm, tr I'm struggling to f understand or, or visualize how that process plays out. And, and I'm thinking back to like a koala workshop where you have these brilliant legal scholars who, you know, I mean, they're very technically savvy, but they're not blockchain developers, they're not software developers, and, and they think more in wet code. 
right? And on the one hand, and on the other hand, you have um, folks like you know Vlad Zamfir, who of course has very strong opinions on this, and 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 um, many other um, kind of software developers. And and in particular, there's as you know a group of people who really like this code is law idea. Um, mm -hmm. Let's also describe the wet code, dry code again for people who may not be familiar with this idea. This is a a term that was coined by Nick Szabo, who is, uh, I believe, both a legal scholar and a computer scientist, which is a pretty rare combination. Um, and he defines wet code as code that is interpreted by the human brain, right? And dry code is code that's interpreted by a piece of hardware or a computer or something like that. So I find this distinction very, very helpful when talking about law. Um, but yeah, just going back to what you were saying, uh, these two worlds are just very far apart and and you know there's very few people like Nick Zabo I think who really understand and are fluent in the language of wet code and the language of dry code and it's been fascinating for me as a dry code thinker to like begin to understand some of the concepts you're talking about uh you know from the more jurisprudence um uh background and, and just you know wet code and, and vice versa I think a lot of I remember a moment in the koala workshop when you know I was talking to some of the, the legal scholars and, and they were asking questions about DAOs. And I was like, look, you know, what if you have a DAO that, you know, is created by an anonymous person and, you know, not people are anonymously transacting with it, but it exists, right? Like say what you want, it exists, whether it's legal or not, you know, is almost besides the point. Anyway, um, this process has to play out, but like how, mm -hmm. like, how do we learn, how do we come together? How do we learn to speak to each other and just make ourselves legible to the other side of the table. That's the part that I find the most interesting. I mean, there's going to be always, there's going to exist some technicalities that I have no idea of and that all of a sudden are going to come up when we're going to talk um, about totally different stuff and it's just going to trigger my interest and we're going to have a deep dive and a conversation until 3 a.m. in the morning and we're going to always explore the fields that we are experts in, right? So. Um, I mean, it was what the second or third koala workshop that I actually explained to people that space law already exists because usually people would be just like, oh yeah, space law, whatever, that's science fiction, right? But it exists for years and so do some of the legal concepts that we might not really um, be addressing in the blockchain space. So for example, what is very interesting to me is the customary norms, the customary law. Um, and those function very differently from what we call the positive laws, the laws that we are actually creating through a political process, through all the lobbies, um, through all the ministries. And then you have two different systems. So you have the common law doctrines or the common law system, and then um, what we have in Europe pretty much. And it's all of those systems are pretty different from each other. And then when you talk to a blockchain developer or uh, when we are talking about a crypto law, these are the concepts that we need to shed some light onto. Um, and I think that this is not even the end of it. <laughs> so there might be even more legal doctrines, even more philosophers that have already thought of that before. Um, I know that there was a bridge not long ago made between the natural law and the positive law, and it was pretty much the result of having the um, world wars. So because the, um, well, because of the idea that Germany introduced that was very much based on the positive laws, people had a need to introduce the natural laws once again, even though the whole positive law idea was actually based on the reluctance to the natural law doctrine. So people wanted to introduce the certainty of the system. People wanted to introduce the hard laws um, and they wanted to introduce the idea that we have to respect the law no matter what, because it is the law. And then once again, people found out that, you know, following the ideas that people had that they wanted to put into the law looking like rule is not the only thing that we have. It's not the only thing that needs to be taken into the account. So, all of a sudden, once again, and that already happened in the Roman times, apparently, uh, people introduced the value system and the idea that the natural law actually exists and it can go hand in hand with a positive law. When we talk about the crypto law, once again, I see that as something that we observe and then put into the code because there is just so many outcomes that we can count and predict. And if the outcome is predictable enough, then we can have a code and we can even call that code a law. 
But if the outcome is not predictable because we need to introduce the interpretation norms or, or the interpretation rules, then we have to first think of the governance system or a system that is going to allow us to um, interpret the code. And I think that that's not existing just yet. This is something that the forks actually showed us. We don't really have a system in the crypto space that would allow us to go through a process and find out what a possible explanation of some sort of a code, um, some sort of a line is, so that we as a community decide whether it's a bug or a feature. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't even exist. Uh, and we, when we are talking about whether how fast the development of the code should be, how fast we should switch to, to the proof of stake, for example, those are all the interpretation norms that can actually be implemented. But right now, we are just thinking about having a crypto law, having something that needs to be introduced to the community. So whether the code actually changes, no, it should never change. OK, so when does it change if it does change? And those are all the procedural questions that we need to address. And I think that having a notion of the crypto law, having Vlad speaking about it so loudly, um, having a lot of people like Nick Saba actually contemplating upon the idea, this is actually going to lead the whole community towards having more and more discussions like that, which is very welcoming. Yeah, it's early days, but the conversations are happening. And I think that's an important mm -hmm. first step. Um, it's interesting, having a, a, an interpretive system like you're describing, um, I think could be really interesting. And you could maybe in some way map this to like a judicial system in, in a modern sort of nation state government. Um, but of course, there's also a lot of people in the blockchain community and Bitcoin and Ethereum, you know, who subscribe to this thing that Vlad called Sabo's law, which is actually we want zero interpretation. We want zero social governance layer. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. If you, you know, if it's interesting to you, tell us a little bit about it. And if you have a position on it. I do have a position on it. I think my position led to me being blocked by Nick Sabo. <laughs> um, I think it's an extremist approach. I think the only, um, well, changes are inevitable and we live for changes. Um, this is how we develop. This is how we move on. This is um, how we upgrade. Changes are welcome. And there is no state of the art or uh, <laughs> even a code that cannot be changed, that can function for us forever. Um, if anything works like that, it's actually the change alone. So. I think that that's what led me to position myself against Nick Sabo to some extent. Um, I mean, I love his interpretations and I love how he explains the laws in this space, but I think that changes have to happen because they can actually improve the whole system. We saw changes for worse, but we also saw the changes for good. And I think that he comes out of the place where he's pretty reluctant to the existing systems. So maybe because the systems are constantly changing or because the changes were actually not as efficient as they should be, he's now sure that he has come up with a system that actually functions the best way possible and is perfect in a way. Um, I disagree, simply because there was a Bitcoin blockchain and now today we have Ethereum blockchain and we're not even sure whether that's the perfect system for us or not. So I think that changes are actually very welcoming. Um, and I would say that we need to find out how we interpret the rules and how we introduce those, in, those interpretation of rules so that we actually create the changes or at least better understand what the change actually is. Yeah, this is such a fascinating question. Um, and again, we could devote hours to talking about it. Um, I, I, I personally, I have this gut feeling that like as autonomous systems like blockchains, but also AI in general, you know, become more common in our lives. And we begin to kind of outsource human agency and decision making to these quote unquote autonomous systems, this question of um, really, yeah, this question of Zabo's law that, that, that I think Vlad articulated and this question of like, to what degree do we want that agency to exist in the human social layer and to what degree do we want it to exist in the quote unquote machine mm -hmm. layer, you know, is, is going to be more and more important. Uh, and it's mm -hmm. this thing that I think we're just beginning to understand. And just to, to, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying, but just to tiny bit play devil's advocate and argue, um, this is so complicated. This is like my interpretation of Vlad's interpretation of Nick Zabo. So like it's been filtered <laughs> through many brains here, but 
um, my understanding of the other side here is that, uh, so Nick talks a lot about this idea of social scalability, right? And the idea is um, if we want people in like different jurisdictions to be able to transact in the most efficient, cheapest way possible, it's really nice for them not to have to think too much about um, social governance and about existing bodies of law um, and instead to be able to just agree on something very simple and like, like a dry piece of code, like, you know, something like a smart contract that has 10 or 20 or 30 lines of, of code. And the only prerequisite here is that they need to both either understand the code themselves or else be able to trust someone who understands it. And that's it, right? And then you now have transactions that are frictionless and much cheaper. Um, so the upside here is efficiency, but the downside is we lose all the other nice stuff you talk about and we lose the ability to like, you know, fix things if they go wrong or upgrade things or fix bugs or whatever. So um, yeah, just this is the most interesting question to me. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, he has a point, right? Um, it's far from the only thing that matters. So whenever we have this type of efficiency, it's going to be used for good, but it can also be just good used for bad. Um, this is pretty much what happened already with the ICOs. So that's one thing. The other thing is that all of a sudden, we have a consortium of 28 very huge corporations that are claiming to uh, be willing to create a global currency as well. And it's exactly the same methodology or exactly the same ideology that you just described. It's Libra. And we all know that we don't really want to go that way um, because it's simply too controlling. And I mean, not only the regulators are freaking out, we are freaking out because we have no idea how our data might actually be exploited when that happens. Um, so all these put together, whenever you have an automation, whenever you have digitalization, whenever you have that kind of an optimi optimi optimization of the whole system, it can also be very simply abused. Um, and how do we prevent those abuses is through regula regulation. Um, so all the states, still have some methods on how to influence the whole community, on how to influence um, the whole development of these type of tokens and this type of um, a code, if you want to say. So I think that uh, this is something that, for example, um, LASIK was talking about. You have different factors that are uh, creating the policy. You have different elements that are actually influencing us in relation to the laws. Um, or the whole innovation. Um, so as far, I mean, the architecture alone is something that we are building right now, is something that the blockchain presents. But the architecture alone is not the only thing and it's always going to resemble our values. So if we are simply just going into the um, idea of having transactions between ourselves where we don't even have to discover our identity, well, that can simply be used for laundering the money. And of course, we want to have methods on how to, um, well, capture those criminals and how to stop those transactions and how to bring justice again into the system. Um, so this is why it's good to have the interpretation introduced. Um, this is why we do need it, because there is uh, always going to be innovation, twofold innovation. So you're always going to have the innovation that you can use for good and for bad. Um, and when is it that it switches from the good to bad? This is where we come in and we do the interpretation. And this is where the changes might actually be made. If we figure out that something was abused, then it needs to be resolved, it needs to be fixed. And this is when we need to talk about how do we fix that system. So yeah, I mean, he's right to some extent. Of course, this is going to introduce the idea of having transactions between people that can replace the dollar and the euro. Sure, <laughs> this is where we are talking about the execution part of the contract, but the creation of a contract and the obligation that are put forth in a contract have nothing or little to do with the execution alone. And those are the rules that we need to interpret. Those are the rules that currently are being interpreted by the courts. And when you are talking about the artificial intelligence, I mean, uh, the development is really, really fast forwarding. So you, you for example, have um, the artificial intelligence or the algorithms that are helping judges in America predict what the outcome, what the ruling might actually look like. 
And this is very much possible when you have a lot of um, rulings out there, when you have patterns that you can observe, uh, when, when you have all the baseline that is needed for the creation of that type of an algorithm. I think it's welcoming. I think we should actually support that idea, not because we want to replace the judges and lower the cost or whatever, but because these can actually help the judges to see themselves in the mirror. So I think that artificial intelligence and whatever innovation that we are creating is actually going to show us what we can optimize and how we are actually uh, not doing ourselves a favor just because of our own nature. That is super interesting. I really like that particular interpretation of AI, right? Not as a system to replace people, but as a system to augment, or I guess like help our judgment. And, and I like what you're saying here about, it. it's like a, like looking in the mirror and kind of seeing, you know, what we need help with, um, yeah, yeah. we can do better. That's, that's super cool, man. I, this is so cool. There are so many rabbit holes here. I'd love to, uh, explore more with you. And I'm actually, beginning to feel like we may need an entire season of humans of Ethereum focused <laughs> on, on crypto law. Um, I want to change gears a tiny bit and just ask about a, a, a separate topic, uh, which is funding, which is part of the, the theme for, for this season, um, understanding how people such as yourself and projects such as DGov, uh, Koala, et cetera, are like um, supporting their work and what's working and what's not working. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts, yeah, like how have you or how has DGov supported itself and what is working, what's not working, what does the future look like? That's a good question um, and a very important one too. Um, I think a lot of people are battling from or are kind of uh, submerged in the business area as well as the philosophical and academic um, fields. So if you want to do a research and you're not an academic, and not into the PhD, then it's going to be very, very hard to have that research being done in a correct way. You really have to sit down and do the research. And in order to do so, you really need to have the funding, the solid funding, you really need to be um, well off so that you don't really worry about that. But then again, I mean, that, that's something that I was constantly thinking of, just having a research and not having um, the introspective or um, not being involved in the business area as well, seems like there is something missing to it. Um, so I think that a lot of these types of organizations, DICAP included, are kind of um, present in every single area almost. So we all want to do a bit of a research and we all want to be a bit of having a bit of involvement in the business sector as well. So a lot of people from business sector would come to Koala, would come to DGov and vice versa, right? So a lot of academics would actually come and see how the industry looks inside out. Um, and I think that that's actually a very good development, but in terms of funding, um, uh, it's almost like startups. Blockchain Philly is actually filled up with a lot of great ideas, um, people that have the courage to just dive deep into whatever it means, whatever it's going to be like in the future. They are very, very okay with being uncertain about the next six months, not even knowing when, where they're going to spend it. Um, and I think that's great for the innovation itself, but as, at the same time, um, it shifts the attitude towards funding. So all of a sudden you're not bound to one single job that you have to have from eight to nine at one place um, and have a boss behind you that is going to take care of the funding. You are your own boss almost. Um, you need to take care of that and leading a community or being involved in that kind of a community, it means that we all need to act like that. So all of a sudden you have a lot of mini bosses <laughs> that are bossing around uh, within a community, but at the same time are going into the same direction. And whenever there are outcomes, so for example, DGov is having quite a lot of outcomes lately. So it's the newsletter, um, it's the Web3 node, for example, that was made. Um, it's the councils, the retreats, there's events being held and there need to be people that are going to take care of those events that are going to pull themselves together for three months or six months ahead of the event and just start organizing all those tiny little bits that you don't even notice when you are at the event. So all these things are the outcomes. And whenever you have a solid outcome that is actually helping the community understand themselves better, I call that a social impact almost. Um, it's not going to be um, in a form that we are used to from the capitalistic world. 
it's not going to be in a form of return of the investment. So even if we are talking about the funding, we are more or less talking about donations and sponsorships. And we can only provide this much. We can only organize the events and show you the value that people and testimonials that people are providing us whenever we have these types of outcomes. So I think this is um, how the attitude is switching and it's worldwide. It's not only limited to the blockchain world at all. We live for the sponsorships. We live for some promises that we made to people that actually want to support our, our ideas. And those promises might not be the profit. It might not only be that they're going to get more money out of it. It's not really an investment like that. Um, but I, I'm very glad to see that there's a lot of people that are willing to support another thing that it, are willing to support something that is not only going in the direction of, hey, I'm having a money, I want to make more money. <laughs> that's something that we've observed and it brought us here in the first place. Yeah, that's a good point. You have a very valid point that this is not just a blockchain or Ethereum phenomenon, um, that I think mm -hmm. this question of like multiple bottom lines and social uh, outcomes, social impact uh, is, is something I think a lot of young people today care about and it's um, a reality for a lot of people and even big companies are beginning to get on board. There was an article in The Economist um, about a week or two ago on this topic about how big companies are now uh, embracing multiple bottom lines and, and social questions and stuff. So it's going to be fun to kind of see how it plays out. Mm -hmm. um, we are almost out of time, but I have uh, rapid fire final questions for you. Uh, if, if, if you're cool with this, um, sure. let's jump in. Okay, cool. Um, number one, what advice do you have for folks who are new in our ecosystem? Instead of finding everything online, just have the courage to speak to people. They're awesome. And, and where or how would you rec recommend like finding people to speak to if you're new? So it uh, depends on where you are new to the system. <laughs> but if you're new to Ethereum, I think there's a lot of conferences that Ethereum community is uh, putting up. <coughs> so one would be DEF CON included. Um, um, so yeah, if you are around or if you can afford it and if you are present, if you are volunteering, um, those are the people that you want to talk to. Uh, also, Twitter is a great source of information, although it's uh, sometimes very bullish on specific topics. But yeah, um, it's good to connect with people that are within the Ethereum community. That's true. I mean, it's definitely active. I have such mixed feelings about crypto Twitter. On the one hand, it's super vibrant and engaged, like you said, but also um, people tend to pile on to like specific topics and viewpoints and stuff. So just have that caveat in mind, I guess. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, cool. Okay, number two, this is kind of an open question, what is the one message that you would like to share with the broader Ethereum community? Hmm. That needs to be just one message. Oh my, okay. Um, okay, so the idea is to form a community that can cooperate, find ways of cooperation, stop pushing each other to the boundaries or um, away from each other. Just start cooperating, find ways of how you can talk to each other. I think it's possible. There just needs to be the interest. So kind of like communicate better or just, just be, be nice to each other. Is that kind of part of your message? Yeah, I, I don't think it's about the communication alone. Um, I actually think it's opening up, but not only through the communication. It's actually on a deeper level. Um, so yeah, communication is the means towards uh, cooperation, good cooperation, but also finding different ways, finding a platform, finding even a medium actually. So you have someone that communicates instead of you if that's necessary um, and to take the time and to identify who you might not really be speaking out to or with um, and that might actually be a relevant stakeholder. So. All those good, tiny details. Good advice. Thank you. Uh, cool. Okay. The final question is what other people or projects or teams do you think we should speak to as part of this Humans of Ethereum podcast series, interview, meme? It's kind of like this whole collection of things. Um, and the emphasis is sort of upon people who are doing really important work, but that are not so loud on crypto Twitter and kind of not so like well known in the community. If anyone comes mm -hmm. to mind. I would recommend the whole dig of 
community. So <laughs> just jump into the Telegram and find out people that want to um, contribute to Humans of Ethereum. I think there's going to be quite a lot of them. Um, there's also a lot of awesome lawyers that are not at all vocal on Twitter. Um, you might actually want to find them in DAO Legal Group on Telegram as well. Um, I can recommend you a few of them if you want to. Um, I know that they would be very, very interested in speaking about the crypto law as well. So, cool. Yeah. Thank absolutely. you. You know, that's, that's amazing. I, I want to do so much more in crypto law. Maybe you and I can... Uh, actually, yeah, it's funny. I remember now when the last time we met, I think it was in Berlin, we talked about um, doing an exchange where like yeah. you, you yeah. teach me, you teach me wet code and I try to teach you dry code and maybe we could turn this into a podcast or a YouTube series or something. I think that'd be really I'm fun. still very into it. Yeah. Okay. I would love to do that. Let's talk about it. I like that idea. Okay. Um, Anya, thank you. I've had so much fun talking to you. We only of course scratched the surface on so many of these topics. So, um, there's so much more to explore here, but thank you for sharing your time and your perspective on everything. Thank you for taking your time as well. And I will see you at DevCon in a few days, assuming you stop being lazy and buy a plane ticket. <laughs> yes, yes. So, <laughs> gonna do that right away. Okay, doing it now. <laughs> Have a good one. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed speaking to Anya. And I hope you've enjoyed this first season of Humans of Ethereum uh, as much as I've enjoyed speaking to all of our fantastic guests. This is the final episode of the first season, and we will be back in a few weeks with a second season, so stay tuned. As always, Humans of Ethereum is completely volunteer produced and self-funded, so if you're interested in contributing to the show uh, with funds or time, or maybe in hosting a future episode, there's information here in the show notes on how to do that. Thanks so much, and I'll see you back in a few weeks. Thank you.